I outlined the 10 lessons I've learned over the years. Did any of those really resonate with you? Or are there ones that I, I left off that you would put up there as important to remember for our listeners, for our audience here? Ralph, why don't we go back to you? Any of those 10 or, or maybe there's some some additional ones you can provide? So actually, yeah, there was two actually from your list of 10. Um, the tiering is something that we do use at AstraZeneca, you know, keep it to a limited number of tiering levels or categories, allows to uh, make decisions easier and to categorize things easier. The other one I thought that was from a previous company I worked at as a consultant, a client of ours, it was along your one about ignoring sunk costs. The client I worked for had a, in the portfolio group, they had a motto, which was kill early and kill often. They thought one of the worst things you could do um, is to keep a project alive just because you've spent a lot of money to get it as far as it had. And to not to continue to, you know, throw good money after bad, just because you don't want to admit that something wasn't working or, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't just keep something going because of the sunk costs that you have had invested. Yeah. How about you, Colin? Um, did any of it stand out to you, any of the tips? Yeah. Well, first, I'd, I'd have to go with Ralph on, on the uh, sunk cost piece. I think that's something that pharma struggles with, right? And the different companies that I've been at, uh, I think has been pretty consistent where it's, it's, a, it's a struggle to really get, I think, researchers, uh, clinicians to think about sunk costs. And I think having a strong financial and portfolio analytics team there to be able to provide that advice in that direction is really important. The other part that I would say is the point that you mentioned around, I'm not sure if it ties to the baby in the bathwater or if it ties to the other one, but um, it's really understanding that rationalization of your portfolio isn't always about removing um, and, and kind of you know drawing your line somewhere in the B to C range, but it's also about what you want to accelerate and where you want to double down and being very cognizant of why you're doing it and what it's going to cost to do that. Um, I think that's something that we've we've worked very hard to do and understand if you're going to do that, that your analytics around what your opportunity is and what it's going to take to get there and the constant reminders that it takes when they see the amount of spend that it takes to get there, that the reason why you're investing that, it's a kind of that constant reminder of that. So I, those, those are the two that really stood out for me. Yeah, that, thanks for that, because you know, it really, portfolio management, resource management, it is a dynamic process where you're pruning low-value projects and reallocating resources to high-value projects. It's something that you're always doing, which which is where the PPM system comes in. It's tough to do that off of disconnected spreadsheets, for sure. Mike, how about you? Yeah, I've always been, um, at least for the past 10 years, a huge proponent of um, your concept of zombie projects and identifying them and really trying to get senior leadership to understand what a zombie project is. Because being in biopharma, you know, we have this whole concept of, you know, we have all these scientists who are now in leadership positions and decision making, and they got this gut feel that, you know, that it's going to work. We just need to do one more experiment. We just need to tweak it just a little bit. And and there's a lot of serendipity involved too, right? You know, and they can always give you the example of, oh yeah, but if we did, if we would have killed that project, we wouldn't have never found, we never identified that. So, you know, there's kind of this balance between it, but, you know, I think introducing the idea of zombie projects to every leadership team is is valuable. Making sure they understand you're not making widgets, you know, you're actually doing something that's, you know, very dynamic. Um, but zombie projects could kill you, you know, over time. And actually doing resource management and portfolio management and trying to highlight how much of your portfolio, how much of your resources are actually working on zombie projects, right? And when you, you know, actually quantitate it and show potentially, you know, that 30% of your resources are burning on these projects that aren't even in your long-term strategic plan you know, then senior leadership starts to catch on and they start to go, oh, okay, you know, this is, now I understand what you're talking about, right? Shine and, a spotlight uh, on it. And to, yeah, to really exactly. It and, and, and try to try to actually pull it out. And my previous larger company, we did it and it and it, I think it made a big difference and, and introduced the idea at Synovian and it caught on pretty quickly that, oh yeah, here's the zombie project. Yeah, we all know what they are. We just don't want to admit it. 
Yeah. The other thing I've done recently, I'm actually writing a white paper on it, is, you know, there's your financial criteria, there's your scoring models to evaluate projects, but I'm finding companies need even more objectivity when they're making the prioritization decisions. So bringing customer evidence and running experiments with your customers throughout development and getting evidence. It's hard to argue with, if the customer is saying there's value, it's hard to argue with that when you're trying to make a decision uh, as to whether it should continue or not. So there's lots of good literature out there. There's lots of good good learnings out there. And I've been working with my clients on how do you run those low cost customer experiments to validate the unknowns and, and uh, bring proof to the table when you're making those decisions. Let's turn to Mel. Mel, how about you? Any of the 10 uh, stand out or do you want to offer up some new ones? No, I, I actually, the, the one I'll, I'll focus on um, was your number nine, where don't throw out the new growth with the baby and the bathwater. And um, I, I kind of mentioned it earlier, and I probably could have saved it a little bit better. When they came out with the, I told you we went from 11 to five, and um, right there on, on number four was corporate development. You know, at first, I was, I'll be honest, I, I saw it, you know, we, we had, you know, from my side, I, I support the tactical aspects, right? I'm in Planus where I'm very, just the numbers of resources and, 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 and how, they, how they stack up. And so we have corporate development as placeholders of what we expect for the year throughout. And before I heard the, the conversation, you know, just showing, I guess, where I'm in the world of tactical, I'm thinking, oh, okay, I don't even have to worry about these guys, right? Just don't. And, you know, very quickly came back and said, no, no not only did they see that as important for that long term right but the fact that they saw this as an opportunity to to be in less competition in going after a corporate development was to me like a real eye opener thinking oh you know once they said it i'm like oh that makes a lot of sense but prior to that i'm thinking oh that's a bunch of things that i'm i got to hear on on hold or you know earmarked that are not going to be used and and so that was to me um, that thinking was was key and and to make it to make you know to make it as one of the five um and to, to be precise number four out of five right so the, they didn't put it at the top but they didn't make it the last one um goes yeah. through this idea of growth as a an as an important piece yeah the, the balancing your core with new growth innovation it really needs to be an and not an either or it's that yep. ambidextrous mindset but too often companies trade off one for the other and they they uh, and trade back and forth so I, th I think the, the companies that do that well manage core and, and new growth as an integrated ambidextrous system are the yep. ones that are going to really, really get out ahead. Yeah, um, and as Robert, I see it here, about, and I was just pointing out, just as you say, it really was treated as an and. And again, as you say, and going here, just, you know, thinking back when I was first pulling up all the data, I just, you know, you get you get wrapped up in like, oh, where does it fit in? And and now, as you say it, I get it. And it's really as an and, and it was treated as an and. And so I, I look at number nine, I don't know, maybe put it as number seven or something. Yeah. <laughs> you need to walk and chew gum at the same time. Robert, how about you? Any of the 10 stand out or do you want to offer some some other tips? Yeah. So maybe maybe I come on the number five. You said reset project pro uh, projection and apply a market risk adjustment. I think that's very important during this pandemic because you know even we tried our best. We have a business continuity plan. Everybody's ready around the top project. Most of the projects are on track, but it's definitely some of the projects are not. Right? We'll be naive think everything is on track. For example, you know everybody touched a little bit about the elective procedures. You know the enrollment, the clinical trial enrollment. We have a lot of projects have a clinical trials going on, right? Because that we're, we're, we have an enrollment issue, we have a follow-up issue, this and that. So the way we use Planetsware is we use Planetsware to to consolidate the intelligence from you know the project team on what's going on, what is the latest of progress, what are the risks, how the risks can impact uh, the milestones and the critical deliverables. So we have a thousands of employees around the globe, you know, R and D employees around the globe. It's very difficult for us to before the plan is it's very difficult for us to get a real time information on every single project. Now we have a platform that everybody can, you know, feed the information so we can consolidate and uh, form the real intelligence around it, have a real time status update on what's going on during the pandemic. 